I'm sure. Let's do this in song. I can't do this in song. Acoustics oh. in song. You guys are That singers, wouldn't though. be wrong. This is going in. But we could channel. talk <laughs> all night if you like. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose at Pose Acoustics. And I am here with two of my good buddies in the industry. I have Adam Pels and Peter Ilep. Alert. But Alert. hey. I'm not... mispronouncing your last name. But... That's <laughs> all good. It's, it's all good. So, Adam, Peter, why are we here? Uh, we are here because for the last two days, we have been teaching a workshop all around the new CDS CTA RP22 recommended practice for immersive audio design. So we had a bunch of people in a room for a couple of days. They were all fantastic. They were a mixture of manufacturers, um, some professional integrators. And really interesting, we had one guy who isn't in the industry but wants to get into the industry. So was just looking for some perspective. Yeah, I thought that was great that we had a wide range of people that came from different aspects of the industry, including those that are outside of it. So, Adam, what do you think was your biggest takeaway from the people coming into this? Like, what kind of stuff were you seeing that you were like, yeah, this was good? For me, the most exciting part is to see the different levels of integrators that come in, but then every one of them realizes that they have a lot more to learn. Yeah. So I was uh, very surprised, actually. So you warned us about that. If you warning is the wrong word. You told us that that was going to happen. And I was thinking, yeah, I'm sure with the guys that are less seasoned, that's probably true. But there were some very seasoned veterans out there who have been operating in this industry for a long time who were struggling with some of the engineering principles, required more help, and were very open about that. So I, yeah, that was true. I'm going I'm to quote the great philosopher Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> with his with his very famous quote that there are the known knowns, these are the things we know we know. There are the known unknowns, these are the things we know we don't know. And then there are the unknown unknowns. These are the things we have no idea that we have no idea about. And what always happens in these sessions is we turn a lot of unknown unknowns into known unknowns. And usually when we teach these courses, we have a bunch of people coming in, really, really good people, that come in thinking that they are cinema, theatre, design heroes, and they all leave going, crap, I have got a lot more to learn. And the great thing about that, and it's, I think it's the same for all of us, it's the same for Matt, it's the same for Adam, it's definitely the same for me, that the more you know, the more you realise that there is so much more to be learnt. And anyone, anyone, be you a hobbyist or you be you a professional, if you think you know everything, what that probably means is that you actually don't know very much. Yeah, I think that's really true. I do. I find sometimes that when I'm with people that are smarter than me, and there are plenty of people smarter than me, that I question how much I actually know and whether I should even be doing this. Mm -hmm. And then I go back into doing it and realize, well, I know enough to get by. But it's important to learn that new stuff and to recognize what's out there. I think the other big takeaway you brought up was the, the, the willingness to bring in help on the stuff you don't know. And to do that, you have to know what you don't know to be able to know when those people need to come in. Adam, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, so it can sound elitist, but uh, both as a student and an instructor on some events, you can also learn quite a bit from people who sounds tacky to say aren't as smart as you, but you know, maybe not as knowledgeable, not as informed because they may present an idea in a way you haven't had it phrased before. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, that's a good, good question. I haven't thought about that because I know this, but that's an interesting way to, to approach it that I hadn't thought of before. Yeah. I think we do learn a lot from the other students. I, the other thing that I learned from this, so I've been teaching, but not this for years. Um, I haven't done it in a while. I came in to do this with you guys. It, you, you encouraged me to do this. And I, I, I think I've realized... Peter's encouragement. Uh, Peter's encouragement. So I've, I've, I've voluntold you. You yes, voluntold you me go. and I said, okay, I'll do it eventually. There's a lot of no's before I finally tried <laughs> to do this. Um, but you learn when you teach. Yeah. And oh, it reinforces things. Like there's a lot of stuff that I know and we use it every day, but we actually do rely on crutches a lot because you have to be efficient. And so sometimes it's like, yeah, I learned it and I know it, but I forgot it. And then you got to teach it and you're like, oh, I don't remember what that is anymore. Is it 6 dB? Is it 12 dB? I forgot what a node was. <clears throat> and it's, I think the reality is doing this, this volunteer work that you've encouraged me to do. It's actually really helpful to keep it fresh 
it gives you a new perspective as to what other people actually know and what they're operating with out there. And it puts us in a better position, I think, to support the industry too. If you were part of the first RP22 class that Peter and I and Ben taught, we would encourage you to come back <laughs> because it's a yeah, little bit better. different. The first class we came to the very, very first um, practical session where one of people actually do thing and we had all this paperwork. And, and uh, there was a few moments of, how do we, how do we do this again? What's, what's the math? And then Apple Android issues of how you enter a log button on different formats, but you guys had the bickering back and forth <laughs> versus Apple calculator. I'm an Apple user. So you're going to sing it now. Two tribes go. To yeah. Well, the maths, the maths was interesting. I say maths cause I, I'm adding a letter cause I'm, I'm British. Yeah. Right. Just like, you know, color is spelt with a U and we don't have aluminum. We have a superior material called aluminium. Yeah. So, you know, we, 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 we like adding letters. You like taking away, but the maths was interesting today because there was a lot of people doing basic trigonometry, doing basic maths for the first time since school. And a few were struggling, and they weren't struggling because they're stupid. There's no stupid people in there. They're struggling because your, your brain and what, what you do with it is like a muscle that if you don't exercise it, you, you forget it. Absolutely. And I know there were some people in the class that are going to go home and say to their kids, I know how to use the tangent button on my calculator, and they, they felt like absolute heroes. But a big, a big part of what we're doing for the last few days is that there's a lot of people in the industry, a lot of enthusiasts that know if they do this, something happens. But what they don't know is why. They don't, they don't know the theory. They can't put a metric or a calculation behind it. And that's, that's a lot of what we've been doing the last few days. Um, simple things like we all know that in a, in a theatre, in a cinema, if you sit in the reference seating position, you have no sound pressure level difference between all the speakers. They're calibrated with the <laughs> pink noise so that at that reference position... Doesn't he get great pink noise, by I, the way? I, I, I do. Really I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good signal generator. Pink noise me. off and see who's the best at it. Okay. Oh, another, <laughs> another time. But let, me, let me finish my train of thought to get it to a station, although I've completely forgot what I was saying. So you were talking about the SPL difference. The SPL difference, yeah. We all know in, in a room that if we're right on the side of the room with our ear right next to a speaker, that our, our experience just isn't as good because our sound field is dominated by that speaker. But what we've done in RP22 is actually put numbers by it. We've, we've put metrics to define different levels of that imbalance at different levels of performance. And everyone today was using propagation loss calculations. So they were using the log button on their calculator, which is a bit scary, to work this out from an engineering perspective, which I think to most people in that class was a revelation. They yeah. knew that this was a problem. They never knew how to quantify it. Well, I think all of us, when we design theaters and we have to interface with the client's team, which often includes interior designers, uh, in fact, contractors and uh, architects, there we go, just gonna the word eventually, um, that we sometimes have to educate the interior designer and the architects on room layout. So one of the most common things I find, and I think you guys at Echo, this happens to you too, is that chairs get placed up against walls or too close to walls, or they put an aisle down the middle. Often it's a natural ergonomic way to do it, but it's a really bad idea on a theater. And I think that when you don't understand firmly why, and it was clear to me after this class that some folks didn't fully understand that, then it's really hard to communicate to the interior designer or the architect why that's a bad idea, and they're going to win that fight. But if you really do intrinsically understand it, and you can have that conversation with them, they'll understand it and say, okay, I get it. Let's move the chairs around to make more sense. So I noticed when we were doing the workshop that a number of people had used chair designs that looked interesting, but they weren't great chair designs. And they realized once they calculated that they had a bunch of these level zero seats. They really didn't have any good seats and it wasn't a great layout, but it was fixable. In one case, it was fixable by literally getting, they had two two chair arrangements right next to each other. If they moved to a single three chair, they fixed the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah seating, seating's so important. In, in every design I do, my first conversation with a customer is, what are you gonna use a room for? And people are often a little bit taken aback with that question because they go, well, it's a theater, I'm going to watch movies. Yeah. But when you then introduce all the other things that it's possible to use that room for, the room then becomes much, much better value. 
because rather than being a dedicated room just to use for that, they can use it for multiple things. And I'm, I'm not a fan of these words, theatre, cinema, media room. I generally don't know the difference in a dedicated theatre and a media yeah. room. Uh, to me, it's, it's performance driven. What level of performance are we going to bring? The fact there's a bar at the back, so what? The fact there's a pool table behind the back row of seats, so what? When the lights are off and the room's in use, that room can be just as high performance as, as any other. And mixed use rooms are fantastic because you're giving up all that space in your house. You're spending all of that money on kit. Why not use that space and use that kit for more things so it becomes absolutely the family's favorite room in the house? I think that that's smart. So I don't know if we disagree. We had some banter, which apparently people liked, and I appreciated doing it. I think that I actually learned by expressing my opinions, hearing somebody else's. But one of the things you were sharing a lot about, and I didn't have a chance to raise this, but it has to do with the conversation you have during discovery. So one of the things I've taken to doing is trying to understand a bit of their life history that brought them to the point of wanting this in the first place. Sure. And in some cases, I've had interesting experiences where people will tell me that when they were a child, I mean, one of my clients is older, by 70s, and he was telling me stories about going to the, the uh, cinema with his dad. His dad would take him to some of the classics, so, so black and white films that would have been CinemaScope. So by him telling me about this and how the reason he likes it now is these fond memories, I knew what I was designing for him. I need a scope screen. I need masking. I need to make this recreate for him in a modern sense, the experience he had as a kid, because that's why he's into it now. It's very emotive. Yeah. And so for me, a lot of the discovery is understanding the passion that's driven to them. Now I have sometimes people who say to me, this is a show pony. I'm going to use it twice a year. I don't care about it. I'm not that into it. It's just, I need to have a theater and it needs to be awesome. Okay. That's informative too. Sure. It's not my favorite project to work on when I know they don't actually care about it. And I might try to look for some way to make something that they actually want to use. But is our, is our job, let's have some banter about this. Sure. Is our job to give the customer what they want or is our job to, to drag out of them to discover actually what it is that they need, actually what, what it is that is, is going to enrich theirs and their whole family life. Because many people think a theatre is exactly that. It's that yeah. single special room to be used twice a year on special occasions. And for some people, maybe that is the right answer. But I suspect for the majority of people, that's just not good value. Yeah, I, that I don't really isn't good value. That. It's more than just trying to drag it out of them, too. One of the things that I enjoy most about um, typically being the last person that the client interacts with before they actually get to use the room is... Yeah, you know, I do an hour, two hour, three hour client demo handoff. And for most of these people, it's a theater room. They're just going to watch movies in it. My demo starts with quite a lot of just two channel music. And I'm still surprised, even though I shouldn't be sometimes, that I'll, I'll judge somebody ahead of time and I'll, I'll think to myself, I'm going to get through three or four songs and they're going to be asking me, when are we going to, when are we going to start the movies? And almost every time it's I'm like okay well let's uh we'll start your movie now but uh can you play this song yeah. that i really, really like yeah and my favorite story um <clears throat> years back, so I, I work with a builder quite a bit and we always try and overlap uh so he's finishing the construction as i'm just starting the the commissioning of the product so if something's wrong he can help me fix it um but this particular job um client second or third home we weren't able to get everything scheduled right. So it was about a year before I got down there to do the calibration of the project. So the client had been using the room for about a year. And I came down, did my work, did my calibration and started my demo process. And I'm starting with a bunch of music and the wife is sitting next to me and I'm on like the third song and, and she's got her hand on my arm, a little uncomfortable. You know, I'm like, her husband's sitting right there. I'm not quite sure what's going on. And then she's like really digging into me and I look over and it was tears are starting to come out of her eye. And now I'm thinking, well, maybe I've done something wrong. Stop the song. And uh, she says, we've been using this room for a year. And it never even occurred to me that we, we could listen to music yeah. here. Brilliant. And um, the, the best part of the story is I sent the client the invoice. And he sent it to his wife. And he sent me her reply, which was, $25,000 is 
awful lot for a calibration, but it was way worth it. Go ahead and pay the invoice. She'd added a zero to it. I was only charging twenty five hundred dollars for the calibration. <laughs> I, I tell you. But but no, she was thought it was worth you know an extra zero on the end of it. So I said, you know, split the difference with me or something. Yeah, twenty five thousand dollars a calibration. The bears tonight are on absolutely, you. Absolutely. Maybe to end this video, what we should say is now the new going rate for right. calibration is twenty five thousand dollars. I'm sorry if you feel that's a lot, but it is well worth it's well it. Well worth it. It is well worth it. Um, so I, I think we should probably close this video up. Uh, do you guys have any closing thoughts outside of that? No, not the story. Um, I just want to I just want to thank you both. Because um, the, the idea of today was that I live in the UK, we're in the States, we're in Chicago at the moment. I It's not sustainable for me to come over to the US every time this needs teaching. I mean, And I am exceptionally happy and confident that I'm, I'm leaving the course in the best hands possible. I appreciate that. And uh, this has been great. So I've met you before. I think only once though, right? Expo, Cedar Expo last year? Yeah. In person. In yeah. person. We talk a lot though. Yeah, yeah. Adam and I... I've known each other through RP meetings. Yeah. But I've never met you. No, not at all. Yeah. You're besties we, now, aren't you? Yeah, we are. Absolutely. We're getting matching tattoos. No. So I, I, he made jokes, though. He's like, I, mean, I was talking about something about being friends. And he was like, what if I don't like you? Yeah. yeah. But I think it's up. Actually, we've worked it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's, yeah. So uh, I am hoping, though, to, I'm going to be in London. So hopefully I'll see you when I'm there. You will. <laughs> and I hope to continue to work with both of you guys. I like you both very much. Respect you professionally. And uh, I think this has been a great experience for the folks that were there, for myself as well. And I think it's a good opportunity. Hopefully we can do more of these types of things. I'd love to do more videos with you guys, but I know that you are world travelers. So we'll have to look for that one or two times a year that I can get you. Find the right time zones. Yeah, we can do it remotely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, thanks for watching the videos, everybody, and keep on watching.